we've talked with a lot of composers about their path, and it's very interesting. You know, some composers have really kind of crazy paths to where they end up. Um, but you're hitting on a certain desire that you identified early on to score film, to put your musical talents to work on a film. What was it that drove that kind of that passion that you identified that you realized this, that, not even this, that over there, that's what I want to do. I know I want to do it. What, what drove that passion? Um, a couple of things. For starters, um, I've always liked films and I always analyze films for many, many different reasons. And the films primarily that I liked were um, uh, provided with a really oddball mix of, uh, of what music was. So I always felt if I'm in the right time at the right place, maybe there's room for me to do that too. You know, we're, we're talking about uh, uh, Shaft with, with like uh, James Brown. We're talking about the first James Bond with, uh, with uh, the John Barry arrangement yeah. uh, score. Uh, we're talking about, funny enough, Saturday Night Fever with all these like yeah. now classic disco songs on it. We're talking about Blade Runner with, with Vangelis. I mean, those were the movies that were really special to me. Um, because of the use of music and how well it it worked. So in my early days, I wasn't the one that would be all over Star Wars and things like that. That was just not really for me. Um, and um, then later in in the in the, the process, I also started admiring more uh, the different uh, disciplines that make up a film. Uh, whether it's directing, script writing, it's the, the set design, it's the clothes design, it's um, the special effects the last uh, 20 years that, that get added. And then of, obviously uh, the mixing process, um, like I said, I was an engineer producer and, and the mixing of the film, the final stage and the dub is something that is so, you know, I'm so fascinated by it and working with the, with the dubbing engineers, how to, how to make things better, how to make the experience better of the film. And... Um, so I, I thought there was hope for me uh, in particularly that world. And then something else happened at the same time, like in the, in the late 90s, um, when I was still having my Junk XL career, um, I felt like I was really hitting a harmonic ceiling and a melodic ceiling. Like I was able to do stuff, but that was it. And that's yeah. when I really started fanatically uh, studying music theory and music uh, philosophy uh, to really get really into what makes things good and um, good sounding and what makes things emotional. And what's really funny is that when you really dive into it, that emotion actually can be quantified, like what that mm. is. And if you use that formula over and over again, every time people will say, oh, that sounds so emotional to me. And then if you divert that path and you do something that doesn't follow certain rules. I'm not talking about rules like you should do this and this and this. I'm talking about rules that have been defined by physics. Um, then people don't necessarily know what to do with that piece of music. And um, Bach has always been a master of that with uh, in, in his uh, time period. And um, so for me, theory became very important as a tool. Whereas when I was studying in my earlier years, I had theory too, and, and I studied music university for a year until I got kicked out. <laughs> um, and um, so what happens is with, with kids that are so young and they get completely drilled and completely brainwashed with music theory and being very technical at a certain instrument, is by the time they're 25, 30, they still haven't figured out what their own voice is, like what they really wanna, wanna achieve. And I think that's one of the reasons why in film scoring, you see so many people come from a completely different background. I mean, let's start with you know, the biggest one, um, John Williams, you know, just like he was the keyboard player and the arranger for Henry Mancini. Yeah. And, um, and I would just worked with Conrad Pope and he said, yeah, if you wanna write like John Williams, just take any song and just like rearrange it and revoice it. That's, that's, that's what he does. That's where he's a master at. So let me get this straight. I could be, if I just rearrange <laughs> Moon River, I'll be scoring just like switch John it around. Williams. Still but you're hope. absolutely right. No, you it's, know, it's, he it's, was Johnny Williams playing sessions yeah. in, in, in LA. I don't think anybody would say this is the future of 
you know the great film so, master. So, so there's so many there's so many comp uh, composers uh, working now uh, currently in LA that have such an incredible uh, colorful backgrounds. Uh, yeah. and um, and they move their way into film and and find like hey you know I have actually more creative freedom. Funny enough, even though you're working on a film and you're working with a director, like for me. Um, when I was music making music on my own as Junkie XL, um, I'm going to use another analogy here. You would basically send me into a room, a really big room that has all the different canvases in the world. It has all the uh, paint types in the world, watercolor, uh, uh, oil paint, all the different tools. And then you would close the door and say like, I want to make you a masterwork and I'll come back in a week. Th those are the scenarios where I usually get lost. Now, yeah. in film scoring, I get, no sent into, I, I get sent into a room. There's only one canvas. There's three colors and one pencil. And now go make your master I love work. that. And that's when my brain goes on fire. Because with the limitations that I have, have I, seem to be, I seem to be stronger in, in my creative output.